Welcome to Detailed, an original podcast by RCAT. This is a show where we uncover lessons learned to help you navigate your next project. I'm Sharice Lakeside, Senior Spec Writer at RDH Building Science and your host. My guest today is Diana Kellogg, architect at Diana Kellogg Architects based in New York City. Known for her commitment to sustainable projects and projects focusing on social impact, Diana got her start in high-end residential design, but has evolved in latter years into nonprofit and community work. A guiding core principle of her firm is its deference to an existing sense of place and history, creating spaces that provide for communal interconnectivity. Diana received a Master of Architecture from Columbia University and a BA from Williams College. Prior to establishing her own firm in 1992, Diana was associated with the firm of Gluckman Tang Architects and Seldorf Architects. Diana Kellogg Architects' work has been featured in various publications, including various notable publications, including the New York Times, Dwell, Architectural Digest, and New York Magazine. Diana Kellogg Architects is a registered minority and women-owned business enterprise, and the firm has won multiple International Design Awards. The project we are talking about today, and again, forgive me with my pronunciation, is the Rajkumari Ratnavadi Girls' School in Jaisalmer, Rajasthan, India. Originally designed to be a multi-structure campus, the school serves hundreds of girls below the poverty line, equipping them with tools for education and independence. Constructed with hand-cut local sandstone in the shape of an oval, the building's form reflects the curvilinear shapes of the local forts, as well as symbols of female strength. Now, let's get into the details. Diana, I am... So unbelievably excited to have you here today on Detailed. I'm so excited to talk about this project. I have been, I've been waiting a long time. I really have wanted <laughs> to hear about this. How are you today? I'm great. Um, I'm, I am here in New York, which is uh, gray and not very, very um, uh, inviting, but I'm inside because I have a ton of work to do. So anyway. I understand you're um, preparing for an exhibition yes that sounds exciting um, yeah i was it's really honored i was really honored to i was first invited to be on the um on the panel on a panel about design and as a catalyst for change which is always interesting to me and then i asked if i could um have an exhibit and they basically a week ago said yes you can but I had no idea. I've never done one. And the amount of work and, and, and coordinating is quite overwhelming. So I've been up all night talking to India. And here I am. <laughs> so if well, I'm a little loopy. No, that's anyway. a, we like a little loopy anyway. So I don't think anybody's <laughs> going to notice. So I typically start the podcast with some silly icebreaker question, like if you could be any animal, what would you be? But I was so intrigued and excited and moved by your mission in this project that I figured, forget the icebreaker question, we're just going to get right into it. All right. So in your website bio, there was a statement that really caught my attention. And that statement was, quote, Kellogg's steadfast belief is that thoughtful design through spatial arrangements versus complicated details and expensive materials is what impacts the lives of people the most. Can you elaborate on that for me? What do you mean? Well, I think that um, often we get very involved with details and materials as architects. And I think that we forget really what our main uh, objective, our main our main sort of cause reason for doing what we're doing is to create spaces that actually function function for what they're what they're intended. So in this project, it was very important to me to provide 
number one, a safe space for these girls. Because, um, you know, it's been interesting because I've gotten criticism from Westerners saying that I didn't provide any windows to the desert. Well, the desert doesn't, isn't, you know, Scarsdale, Arizona for these people. It's, it's very different. It's, um, these are young girls who mostly don't leave their homes. And, you know, the desert, they, they've had the desert all their lives. So I wanted to make an internal space that focused on, on really being able to be calm, centered, and to really be able to learn. And, um, you know, in a place, I've actually seen it kind of when I've been at the school, the girls often, <clears throat> I can sort of see them get off the bus and they just like relax when they walk into the space. Because, you know, in some ways it's a, it's a fortress, but it also gives sort of a very different perspective because it's really all about the sky. And, you know, what is more um, kind of enlivening for learning than the vastness of our world? So, you know, I, I like to think that I, that I accomplished what I wanted to do. Um, and um, I do know some of the girls have said that when they walk into the space, they feel free. And that's an incredible, incredible um, compliment. That's that, that I, I, I love. I love that. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, wh who doesn't want to empower young women anywhere in the world, especially in places where it may be more difficult for a young woman yeah, than to, you know, to be able to reach for the sky and, yeah. and go after what you want and be in a safe place that uh, promotes that feeling of calm and learning. I'm, I'm just in love with this project. I'm in love with this project. So, okay. The school is incredible. I, I, I spent probably more time on your questions for the school than any episode I've done so far because I, I'm so enthralled. So I wasn't really sure where to start. So let's start with the client, the mission, and the environment in the area of this school. What's the history and background and what was the need? So it's a, it's a very long history, as with most of these projects. I um, was asked by Michael Dabe from the Cheetah Foundation in India to work as an architect on this project. Um, I hadn't been to India. Um, I came on my first trip, and I actually brought my 13-year-old daughter, and I just fell in love with it. It was actually very interesting to see, to see India through her eyes, too. Um, and actually, she's been involved in it since and is also always giving me kind of um, good feedback um, about, you know, I've been learning from her a lot about like gender equality and, you know, what I've been kind of set up to accept as normal and what she doesn't accept because she's, she's 21 now. And so, you know, it's, it's fortunately things are moving albeit slowly, but they're changing. So the environment, you know, I met just the loveliest people when I when I arrived there. Dysmere is a very special place, just as it is. Um, and I visited a lot of different schools. And, you know, there's just this kind of amazing, um, kind of unabashed, like, willingness to learn and curiosity to learn you know i think so many of us in the u.s where we're so privileged we take education for granted and we can be a little bit jaded by the idea of you know oh of course i have an education but it's not of course i have an education for many and particularly for these girls so um because of, you know, a whole variety of reasons that have to do with gender norms and, and, and whatever things are, it's just a complicated. Also, India, I've learned and grown to love is such, it's, I mean, it's such a, uh, amazing, um, cultural kind of enigma, uh, to somebody like myself, I'm American and I realize that we are just like fledgling babies in the world and it's always surprising to me what anyone would ever listen to anything we have to say because you know these countries are centuries centuries old and deep with with knowledge and you know the natural kind of 
complications of what's evolved over over just so many years. And we we frankly don't have that. You know, we are so much younger. Our experiences are are much are much more uh, are much different. They're much uh, more contained. They're much more the fractions, believe it or not, are not as fast. Um, but it's amazing to learn about it. That's I love so much about the work I'm doing. I'm doing other projects now um, in Kenya, Zimbabwe, other parts of India, and I just love actually learning about the other cultures, not just because I love art history, art, architecture, but also I really love the um, just the exploration of, you know, how human beings function in, in other places. For example, you know, every, we in the United States, I think for the most part, have kind of lost our, our kind of local connections. And in India, anyone can look at somebody and say, that person's from this place. That food is from this place. It's, it's, it's something I think that we all are beginning to lose globally. And so I just find that fascinating about all the projects that I'm, you know, eagerly taking on, um, you know, to do a project. And I think that, you know, to do a project in India, you you need to know where you are and you need to know exactly, uh, you know, the place you are in Rajasthan. It can't just be I'm doing a building in Rajasthan. I think that's a lot what's resonated with people is that this is very particular to Jaisenir. Uh, um, so what so what what made them want a girls school? I, I don't know how how they, typical uh, that is in, in India. I mean it's not that there aren't girls schools in the United States as well, but it's it's not a typical model. Uh, what brought the need or what was the need that made this school happen? Um there is a very low literacy rate amongst um, women in general in this part of the world, um, and particularly for girls. Um, I think often schools aren't safe for them. Um, I think they're also because of the caste system, because of a variety of things that are just you know ingrained in the psyche. Um, you know, they're not valued which is surprise, surprise. I mean, they're not valued here. So like you can imagine they're not, you know, they're not valued there. Um, although, you know, I have only experienced enormous amount of love um, and, and uh, appreciation by the families for the girls, just naturally. But it's just not a cultural norm to have your daughter achieve. You get married, you become a wife, and that's success. And, um, you know, as we all know, you can be a wife and be other things. And, um, yeah, that's a message the whole world needs to know. <laughs> well, hopefully we will get it out to the whole world because I couldn't agree with you more. And I think that's why I fell in love with this project almost immediately. So this is an amazingly, and you know what, I was... I was so impressed by this building. I didn't even notice the no windows thing. So not everybody <laughs> thinks the no windows is a bad thing. Um, I, I I just assumed it was because of the heat. Make well, more yeah. sense. <laughs> yeah. But this is an yeah. amazingly beautiful oval building. I read that because this is a center that will empower and educate women, that you looked at feminine symbols across cultures when starting the design, specifically symbols of strength. And I know yeah, more I, about that, but tell me a little bit more about that. I just kind of, you know, I, I just basically did, started with a basic Google search for, you know, symbols of femininity um, globally um, for strength. And then I kind of found, I found that this, the oval, the ellipse, just had, showing up and it's not really surprising because it is a womb um it's also an egg it's um it's it's also incredibly embracing sort of like motherly love like i like to think that when people enter the space they feel like they're embraced 
and they feel like they're held. And, um, you know, I think that people have felt, have said that to me, that they feel like they've gotten sort of a big hug when they come in. So, yeah, that's kind of the genesis of it. And then the other, it sort of expanded from there because I liked the idea of the repetitive, because there's a second phase to this project, but the repetitive ovals, which actually symbolize to me or are figuratively the symbol of infinity and then symbolize to me sort of this um, continual chain that could wrap around the world just also you know, awfully, just, you know, um, uh, metaphorically, obviously, but that can um, be about hope and be about holding hands together, male, female, whatever, and um, continuing to lift everybody up at the same time. Um, and I just think that that's another thing about the, the shape and that was fascinating to me. And then, you know, since I've learned, since I did this, I can't tell you um i've been uh contacted by all kinds of people who have shown me that there's there's a group um 64 yogini um temple and there is actually 64 of these temples that are the same shape as the school but i have no idea and actually i recently saw a photo that's fascinating to me that the original villages in 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 Jaisamir. and there's still some that are that are that are there today, but they're on the border of Pakistan. They're circular and they're oval, and um, it's just you know these references come up and up and up with you know people sending me pictures of buildings in Saudi Arabia or everywhere that have this. I mean, look, if we we as architects we only have so many shapes that are that we can use, um, but. It seems like this. It's just it's kind of amazing that these these shapes show up. Oh. I call those messages from the universe. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, it came to you because it was supposed to come to you, um, and then you discover later, wow, okay, wait a minute. There's these other places and these other things. It's come to other people as well, right? I don't know who's sending the messages, but those are messages from the universe. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's start broadly. We'll get more detailed here in a minute. But broadly, what kinds of spaces did you design within this building? What were the special needs that you needed to have in this building for these these students? Um, really just the class. I mean, you know, it's a school, so there's a repetitive classroom shape. The classrooms, because of the oval, are natural kind of amphitheaters in the sense that they're shaped, you know, with slanted sides like an auditorium towards the teacher um so you know that was another kind of discovery through the design process um and i needed these classrooms to be very um you know they had to have natural light and actually we've been very lucky the natural light they, we, they barely turn on the the uh the overhead lights um because they get just this beautiful natural light and some of that is um I mean, there's beautiful light in, in this area of the desert, but also we did the walls in, in lime plaster, which is used also as cooling, but also reflects the light really lovely in, in a really lovely way. And then, so that's the bulk of the spaces. And then I, there's a, um, a teacher's room. Um, there, there is currently an art room which was also very important to me. I think that the um, the development of, of arts through education is is very important. And um, and then there's also the I used the space on the roof as a place for them in cooler weather to sit up and have outdoor classrooms. Um, they love to run around up there. Um, and then the other thing that I, I, well, a couple other things that I did is, you know, normally you have these kind of really ugly uh, metal water coolers kind of sitting in the middle of the space. And obviously water, cool water is very important in the desert. And what I did is I hid them behind the wall and then just had the plumbing fixture go out to this, these circles um, that the kids can drink water from and then the other space that i created 
um, is what I call the play wall. Um, there was, I actually only had, I had one amazing person here in the U.S. working with me, and I realized I needed somebody in India. We had no money to do any of this, and I worked pro bono. My associate here was paid. Um, and then we had this amazing woman jump on to volunteer, and I was discussing this play wall with her, and I had a big slide. Um, and she said to me, you know, she calls me ma'am. Actually, she used to call me respected madam. And I was like, <laughs> stop. Right, stop that. So I said, um, you know, what do you mean? Girls don't like going down slides. And she said, well, no, they, you know, they need privacy. It's not a cultural norm for girls to go down a slide. And I said, have you ever been to a playground? Do you find that the girls don't go down the slides? She said, well, in this cultural context, they don't. So what I did is I used what they call jolly walls, which are these screens that women are typically hidden, hid behind in buildings, and they only observe activities that are on the streets or public forums and stuff through these screens. So I gave them a, a privacy screen, but it was blocks instead of of this kind of intricate carving that they do. And um, so they could, you know, have just, they could go down the slide, basically. Um, and that part still has to be worked out. Um, unfortunately, we got to the end of the project and sort of money ran out. So a lot of the things that were in my design haven't been completed. Um, I hope they will. We had, for example, uh, a shading, two shading devices in the courtyard, which are not there, um, which I hope will be there at some point. Because it gets so, amazing how different. I, I asked that question specifically because when I think about a school, you know, there's auditoriums and there's a gymnasium and there's a big cafeteria and kitchens and all of these different things. And I didn't see a lot of those spaces in your project description. Well, the courtyard is actually actually a natural amphitheater, um, and I've been told the acoustics at their morning assemblies are um, exceptional, and that you know the shape actually lends to very good. It's an auditorium, and then the the, the courtyard has uh, steps that you can sit on to watch the performer or the person speaking. There's this incredible architectural feature that's, I, I don't think I've seen it. I've never seen it in other countries, which are these stack wells that they, um, they used to, uh, as wells for, for water. And so this, that to me, the referencing of steps for the kids to sit on was sort of a step well, um, and so that's your auditorium. And then the way they eat is, um, is not necessarily the way we eat. And actually, so there's a hut that was there before, which is the kitchen. And they have two meals a day, which is amazing that Chita can provide that. Um, and they actually eat typically out on the sort of veranda outside of the classrooms. We don't have a shading device, so they're not doing that, but they sit down and then they're served. And actually, I was researching kitchens, cafeterias for this project, and I saw a photo of Bill Clinton in a line at sort of a cafeteria setting, which we're used to. And I was like, well, they do, you know, the People I was working with said, that's, you know, they won't have that. They don't typically, you know, they they sit down and then they're served. And I said, well, here here's Bill Clinton <laughs> in the cafeteria line. And they were like, that's totally a, 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 a prop that was done for the photo shoot or whatever, the photograph. Nobody in any schools in India eats. So um, I don't know if that's the case, you know, universally, but in, in, these, in these rural uh, um, communities, that, that's, that's how they eat. Um, so, yeah, so there's that. So there is no need for a cafeteria. I mean, it, it's a very simple building. 
um, I mean, it's very, it's got a lot of complexity in terms of the design, but in its function, it's, it's a very simple building. You know, it's classrooms, a corridor, um, and, and that's it. And they actually use the, the courtyard as a gymnasium. So, and again, that's not something, uh, girls in general are encouraged to, to, to do. Um, they, you know, and actually I fortunately had this amazing woman, um, who calls herself fit girl, um, who contacted me and we were in discussion for a while and she was, she was at the time, I think sponsored by Nike. I don't know right now, but she said that, um, she really wanted to volunteer in places like this. I mean, she has a pretty big name for herself as a, as a fitness person, but the whole idea of mind body development is so important. And, um, she actually said to me, you know, these girls in particular, because they haven't been, they've been mostly in their homes. The boys can go outside and run around, but the girls don't. So she said very, from a very basic way, they needed, um, you know, just balance and, and, and just really basic kind of physical development, um, because it actually leads to health problems later. And also it, it's mind stimulating. So she does all of her uh, classes in the courtyard. And, you know, the thing about the, I mean, it's it's all weather dependent in India. Basically, they have no rain except for during the monsoons. And they're, the school holidays are, are, are arranged around the monsoons. That's starting to change because of the global warming basically the monsoons aren't as predictable and the colder weather isn't as predictable and even the there's seven years that i've been going there it's suddenly gotten to be much hotter um so um that's something that you know needs to be addressed but basically they are you know doing um, they have an athletic warm-up much like a yoga um every morning so. I, I do Pilates three days a week and and have for a number of years. And that core strength in just it, it, it has been a game changer in everything that I do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the not getting any younger, you know, you have to squat down to pick something up off the floor, which is a part of everyday life. You want to be able to do that successfully wow. and not hurt yourself. So I, I think it's wonderful, especially in that kind of environment that these young girls are being exposed to those kinds of things that would just generally help them be more healthy people. Yeah. Um, and they haven't been, that, that screen for the slide that just blows my mind that I just, it's so hard to even relate, you know, cause it's such a, you know, you wouldn't, we, I would remember hanging upside down on the monkey bars, probably in a dress when I was a kid, you wouldn't think twice about it. Um, I understand the intent is for this school to be part of a larger three building complex. At, at least that was the plan at one time. Um, can you tell me more about that and how these future plans affected the process of your design for this building? Um, you know, my, my design for the building was always the three buildings. Um, the, um, the building of just the school was, um, was, you know, a decision that we made, um, primarily just, you know, for, for financial reasons, but also it was the building that was uh, for me, the most immediate, um, concern was to get the girls in school and, and they are, and they add girls, she just doing an amazing job adding girls, um, you know, every new, uh, semester from the younger grades up. Um, but Right now, there's, um, I mean, I'm not really involved in the programming of the school anymore, um, or, or was I? I was just involved in, you know, creating physical space for the programming. Um, I mean, I, I was involved because I was passionate about it, but basically they're doing, um, 
for a whole slew of reasons. They basically set up the women's cooperatives. Um, so the idea, which was Michael Dabe's idea, which is which which is brilliant, is to actually have the school um, work with a women's cooperative, so that the women, their mothers mainly or or not, could be working at the same time as the girls, um, and um, you know, and generate money to pay for the school. So. Right now, it's at a growing stage, and they're doing, uh, I think, workshops. The, the women are reluctant to go to to leave their homes. They've been doing these incredible, um, you know, textiles and handicrafts in their homes. So I I believe what Tita is doing is it's organized for their homes, and then they come. To, there is a room. There's extra classrooms in the center because, like I said, they're building up from... Um, the younger grades. It, these children have no education at all. And, you know, they need to know very basic things like how to hold a pencil and, you know, things like that. But they learn extremely quickly. And, um, but so, you know, for understandable reasons, they can't really bring in the older children first. So they come in until so they'll grow. So this is just growing naturally and it's growing in a beautiful way. And, um, uh, you know, the uh, administration there is doing a great job. So um, so the course shifted. Um, hopefully these buildings will be built. Um, but um, we'll see. Uh, I, I definitely but, love the concept. Yeah. You know, because oftentimes women have to, in, in a lot of countries, women have to stay at home because they have to take care of their children. Right. So if they can have their children at school and be right next door, actually you know working or you know selling something that they've made or whatever and make money for the family and have their kids in school to where they can have the time to do that it it lifts up the economy of that area in multiple different ways yeah. you know not just getting more education but also you know lifting up the family and being able to provide for their needs yeah so i i hope that that happens at some point you got to get the women to want to come out of the house i get that but um yep. You know, hopefully that'll happen. Um, so I've interviewed a few architects about projects outside of the United States. I love those interviews because they're always just so incredibly interesting. Often there are interesting stories about the differences in how people work in different parts of the world, in, in our industry. Can you tell me a little bit about your design and con consultant team and how you navigated working in an area that is drastically different than working in New York. Um, what what did that process look like? Um, it was very interesting. It was a real um, eye opener for me. You know, I had you know one of the best architectural educations available in the world at Columbia University, but no one had taught me how to do a foundation in the desert. Um, there were, you know, just sort of physical things that were difficult. You know, you would be standing, reading your plans, and there'd be sweat all over them, and then suddenly your phone would die, and, you know, because it was too hot, and all kinds of things like this would happen, and the sand would be in your eyes, and, like, you know, all, all kinds of just sort of things that culturally I'm not used to, um, and so I had to adapt to those things, Um and, you know, there was, you know, we use different terms uh, for, like, I was saying lintel meaning something, and they were saying lintel meaning something completely different. So there's, um, there's that that we had to do, you know, and they're, in general, they're not accustomed, at least in this part of the world, to have um, very specific drawings that they follow. I mean, that's, that's not the not universal but it's it's is part of the process so one of the things we did is we uh, um we are actually my my colleague basha um put together an animation of the building and it was this this incredible experience to watch the main builder kareem khan um 
see the see the walk through through 3D goggles while I was standing there in the desert with them. So to have this incredible like connection between New York and, and you know this rural community was through technology was just amazing. And he actually was looking through the 3D goggles and he like took them off and a big smile on his face. He's like, now I understand. Um, and, you know, that obviously is, is an incredible tool we have now, which we use to explain buildings to, to clients and to explain to builders. Um, and um, it's, you know, it's the juxtaposition between this very remote um, rural place and, you know, the bustling city was just this kind of, it just felt like magic. It was like, you know, you can, you can do so much. I mean, that's another thing that I've really learned, especially during COVID, because I couldn't travel. Um, there was so much that we could accomplish remotely um, through video. And, you know, obviously there's no comparison to being in the place. But I had already spent a lot of time there. Um, I think, you know, a lot of architects tend to actually never visit when they do these schools in different countries. Um, you know, I insist that we visit and I insist that, um, you know, if possible, my, um, my, the people working on the team can also visit. I actually, because of all of this work that I've done and because I'm having so many requests for more projects and so many letters from young architects, particularly women, but also men saying, you know, I want you to mentor me. I want to learn how to use my skills for the betterment of society. I want to learn, you know, I'm a passionate architect, but I, I, I want to, I want to make this into something like what you've done with the school. Um, so I've sort of gathered all of those names and then gathered all of the names of out people reaching out to me and they're, you know, all over the globe. I'm, I think I'm moving into Africa, the next stages. I've got other projects going in India. Um, but, um, and I'm actually starting a nonprofit for basically the services that we've been providing, which is, um, you know, design services, sort of helping these NGOs who who are all heart and all intention, but don't know how to kind of take it from from step A to step B. So um, I've, I've just decided to put these people, you know, put the, the students together with the NGOs. And my team in India knows how to do this now. And we've developed different principles that are important to do this. And, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see where this goes. I don't know. Well, I, I'm impressed, really impressed. So I'm curious, what is the process? I'm really curious because this is always an interesting question. What is the process in India for things like permitting and building codes? I mean, I've, I've, I've talked to some architects doing work in other countries that kind of laugh a little bit, like building code. What's that? Um, does it exist in India? No. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's very simple, basically. We got the government requirements for um, for the school, the proportions of the school. Actually, the second two buildings um, were for a, a, a library that they required and science labs and things like that. So, um, but that was another thing in the middle of the process. I, 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 I learned that we didn't actually have to comply with those. Those were country-wide um, requirements. So the 20 volume, vol the 20, um, 20 volume library that 20,000, sorry, that I had made space for wasn't necessary. So, um, we had to do a quick change and we decided to make that more of a museum space for the women's cooperative. Um, anyways, that, that aside, 
No, there aren't. And if you see, I mean, it, I don't know how these men and women do these manage these stairs that are just like standard in India. It, they're stone, they're slippery. They do it so gracefully and in heels. And like, you know, I've seen the royal families in saris going up and down these stairs like, you know, two-year-olds and with heels and just it's, it's amazing to watch, but, um, you know, we complied with the codes we're used to complying with, um, to the, <laughs> to the point of, um, one funny kind of cultural clash was our bathrooms because, um, we in the United States were designing for accessibility and a wheelchair clearance and all of these things. Um, in India, they were like, you know, don't need this. <laughs> in fact, the result is a little bit like we made bathrooms for the four seasons because to comparatively they're, they're oversized. Um, and that's something we can change. You can always add, add more toilets, but the girls think the bathroom is like their playground. They've never experienced <laughs> a bathroom. Um, you like those or or at all so um in the beginning we had some trouble they were you know playing with the water all of the the only thing that's broken is all of the plumbing fixtures broke because they were <laughs> they were overusing them and so yeah that's 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 something um, we would we may alter in the future uh, just to add some more toilets because we don't need this amount of space uh, but things we would never think about here, just yeah, never ever think about here that being yeah you know, well, that a, that reaction. Right. I mean, in school, how did you feel about your bathrooms? You probably were like, I don't really want to go in there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sure as heck, didn't want to go in there and play <laughs> ever. So let's get a little more technical about the design. Let's start with the exterior and in the courtyard area. I happen to work now for a building enclosure consultant. It's crazy hot there. So I'm I'm curious about the enclosure, the wall assemblies. Tell me about the pattern design materials that you used on the building enclosure and in your wall assemblies because of the heat. I, I, I'm sure that's probably one of the first concerns. Usually it's the other way around. Like you, you want to keep yeah. it warm inside. Yeah. Um, not, not the case there. So tell me a little bit about the enclosure design and the okay. materials you used. So a couple of things were given, you know, we were not going to have that air conditioning. That's we were, we were, we have no windows per se. I mean, there's no glazing anywhere. That's not practical. There's too much sand. Um, you know, also in terms of, of considering the enclosure and the temperature in the building, you know, they come from um, uh, on air conditioned homes. Um, and so the my objective was to make it, you know, as comfortable as possible and more comfortable than their homes they were used to, but certainly not bringing it up to standards that may be you know uh part of the other communities that they're not used to because quite frankly they would be sick if they were in like ultra air conditioned buildings and you know this this has come up a lot um you know the uh for one of the first interviews i did they asked if it was air conditioned and i and i said no and um you know and basically then it became this, you know, this building in the desert doesn't need any AC. But the more I actually gave a talk in India in 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 Mumbai and basically was mostly an Indian audience and somebody said, you know, why haven't you given these girls air conditioning? Do you not think that they're worthy of it? And um basically everybody and it was a very well educated group said we didn't have air conditioning in our building 
And I think about in the U.S. I mean, I grew up on the East Coast. We didn't have any air conditioning. And, you know, even at the, um, you know, the, the top tier Ivy League schools, they still don't have any air conditioning. Obviously, just we don't have the same heat, the heat level. Um, but, you know, it's starting to get up there. But, you know, it's fans work very well. And the way it's designed with the windows high up, circulation of the air of the hot air goes through and out the doors um so the construction of the walls i went at in a very simple way i basically asked questions and asked questions of people who built there for centuries and how they managed to keep the buildings cool and how they managed to uh keep the buildings from the, the walls from falling over in this shifting stand condition so um my fancy education was put to the side and I had to just start with, you know, what you could call a beginner's mind and actually just be um, receptive to, to what, what, what they were comfortable using. I mean, I learned early on in my architectural career, somebody wiser said, you know, never um, ask somebody to do something that they're not comfortable doing. Um, then, yeah, you can push and stretch things wherever you are in this country, in any country, but like really you shouldn't have people work with materials they're not familiar with, they're not comfortable with, or, you know, but boy, these, these, uh, these, these stone workers, these craftsmen, I mean, they are just like magicians of stone. Um, for example, we were asking, we wanted to use these oversized sinks and we were going to get them from Dali and they were expensive. And the builder contractor said, what do you mean? We'll, we'll just carve them out of stone. Like carve this stuff like butter. And it's just, it's, it's phenomenal to me. Um, but our, our wall construction was basically what I asked them for a wall section which we which we used um which was you know a composite of sort of a veneer thir, thir, veneer uh cladding and then um kind of a an infill and then we use the plaster on the inside for for cooling there's other features that i used they have on on all of their buildings they have the, what what i refer to as a sudden a sun canopy which is over the windows which basically stops the direct sunlight from coming in they use it in com common practice in many many of their buildings so i just looked at the buildings in jason here you know, asked questions what this is for and use what they used um and i put it together in a in a way that was um modern you know, or contemporary. And I did that very intentionally because I, I knew, um, that the, um, the, the, the craft was actually dying out. Um, the, you know, the sons were no longer interested in pursuing the, the stonework. And that I thought it'd be very valuable to be able to show that you can do something that's modern, that's temporary that's of our time out of stone instead of what typically is happening is they go to steel and glass because that looks like it's it's modernized it's it's you know it's western or whatever but um you know it's just not the right material for this climate so um so yeah i i learned from them you know it was a whole journey and i we didn't have money for an engineer for the first phase, but we had money um, for an engineer from the second phase. And, um, you know, these these ellipses that I had designed, I had worked with a, a great engineering company here in the U.S. who volunteered their time and who are amazing, amazing reputation. But not surprisingly, they put a grid over the oval. Whereas I was working with this uh, this engineer in in India, and he 
he sent me his first image, uh, a hoof in the sand, <laughs> of what the concept was. And he said, I'm going to use your design as, uh, as the structure. And the gravity of the walls in the earth, like the, the hoof of the cow, will actually create its own support. So um, this this gentleman um, used used the shapes because they are actually arches just on the ground, and the arch is natural structurally structurally uh, uh, coherent uh, form. And so he looked at it in that way, and um, we came up with a very different structural system. <laughs> so it's I, like. We I all love that. need to learn. We all need to learn. Um, so, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole for a minute because you mentioned this earlier when we were talking and it keeps popping back up in my head. So I have to ask, what do you have to do differently to do a foundation in the sand? <laughs> well, they build it kind of like a pyramid um, out of stone. Instead, we do we typically do a vertical with a, a footing. Their upside down T. They, because you know of the pressures of the sand, which actually can help support the building, because the sand is you know continually pushing in on the on the structure. So this pyramid is is what we use. Um, it's sort of stacked, stacked, um, stacked solid stone. Wow. I, I just, I had to ask that question. It's like, <laughs> I have, no, I have no idea how to answer that question. So tell me a little bit about the design of the interiors of the spaces. We talked about the types of spaces you have. Um, and, and I know very intentionally and, and makes total sense to me is you kept things very simple, but what I, I looked while the interior spaces were simple, they were still beautiful and they were still, in my opinion, elegant. What are some of the materials that you used on, well, on think, the interior spaces? Locally available materials, um, you know, and also, I mean, I felt it was very important for basically practical reasons and also for the one of the, um, you know, the the, um, the goals of the of the of the foundation of the project was to involve community. So. Um, it was it was kind of also an interesting journey because I they kept saying just order the school furniture from Delhi and there's a town that you pass through called Kanoi on your way out to the school and I was told that all of the men there where most of the men there migrated to Mumbai to work in furniture factories and so I said I I said well can't we use these guys next door? They're a 15 minute drive with things need to be repaired or replaced or, you know, anything. They're, they're here. They'll have a vested interest in it because, you know, it put a pride for them. And, um, and it was very funny because I couldn't find one. And I'm, I was like, I know in that village there's somebody who can build these desks and chairs. And, um, took a long time of asking um um and we found this father and son who indeed made the desks and chairs um and the benches i used a sharpay material which is something they use kind of in these sort of beds that they use so we use that in an unusual way um the wood was obviously imported or not imported, but from another part of India. Um, but yeah, all local local materials. You know, I believe simplicity can be extremely elegant. Um, I think you know your quote in the beginning. You know, fancy or complicated details and materials aren't necessarily the way to go. It's sort of like a, a sparkly gem on somebody's hand that you're attracted to, but it's not maybe what 
you need everywhere in the building. Um, we did, um, you know, like I said, budget was a concern, and we did um, do the identification for each of the classrooms out of flowers um, instead of, and then on the donation wall, uh, people, the people who donated to the classrooms, they were given a stone um, replica of this flower that that, that uh, identified the classroom. So, you know, when you go a lot of times to these buildings, you see these names on them and, you know, which is fantastic, but it, it always is slightly jarring to me because I immediately see it. I think like, oh, did that person up here come here? Like, do they know where it is? Do they know that it is here? Do they, you know, it's sort of, you know, I think it takes the ownership of the building away from the people who need to own it, which is the, the, the kids and the teachers. Um, and so, um, so that was one area where we sort of splurged on, um, on carvings was the stone carvings that identify each, each building. So that's, you know, and then, then, um, again, with the lights, in the classrooms, um, I again didn't want to import the lights from Delhi because there's too many parts that can't withstand and that constantly are broken. It, they can't uh, stand up to the the temperature changes and the water and the sand. Um, so for the lights. I wanted for the classrooms to be these big sort of hanging baskets and you see baskets everywhere. And again, that was like an interesting thing because, you know, getting someone to do a four, four foot wide basket was harder than you would think. And, you know, it was sort of like, I remember Michael going out to these villages and saying, well, look, you've made this um, basket here. You know, you can just do it bigger. And it, it takes, we all do this. It's a mindset. We're used to doing something a certain way and to, and to flip it isn't, I mean, I'm finding this, I'm starting a project in Mongolia. It's the same thing. It's like, you know, why would you do it that way? And I've, I've, I'm really learning. You just cannot stop asking questions and listening and listening and asking questions and, you know, finding out why and then, you know, in, in, in cases, coercing them into doing it the way, um, or convincing them, sorry, to, um, do it the way that you're suggesting for another. So these basket lights were made and, um, they, they worked and they very, you know, they were very inexpensive and natural to the environment and the electrician who lives in Jason you know, basically assembled them. So if there's any issues, again, he can address them. And then the, the lights on the outside of the building um, were, again, made in the same sort of, with the same ideals. I, the electrician, again, who had um, done all of the wiring for the building, I said, here's the light pictures I'd watch, I want you to make. And he said, I can't make a light picture. And I said, well, you can wire to the location and then we can work with the stonemasons to create the enclosure. And so there's back and forth. And then what we have, I think I, what I, first of all, I think would have been incredibly, you know, inappropriate to have like these, like a brass light fixture in the building. So basically we use translucent white uh, marble that's available locally. Um, created kind of uh, uh, an alcove and a place for a light fixture with this, this stone lens over it and the electrician wired to the spot. And they're actually, the school's really beautiful at night. Um, they, you know, one of the intentions, which I hope will be uh, part of the program, was they were going to have kind of evening um evening events that were you know dance or music or things like that so um it, the lighting in the desert is is quite beautiful um and so they did 
three different kinds of light fixtures. So, so one of the thing that I one of the things I keep thinking about is, I mean, not only is just the school itself an incredible mission, doing a really great thing, but it it truly this building is, in my opinion, my humble opinion, which is all it is. A true testament to what architecture is supposed to be about, really to its core. Um, it, it's a testament to setting ego aside and figuring out a way to de design something beautiful to, to meet the needs of that community and those people and, and the way that they live, not to create a monument to your design skills which are, are amazing, but, but that's not what architects are supposed to do. They're supposed to create this facility that perfectly fits the people that have to use it. Yeah. And, and how they have to work. And you have done exactly that. Wow. You know, and you. you're going into some of these details about things you looked at and why it would be inappropriate to put in a brass light fixture or, or whatever. And, and, and the thought and care that went into that to, to create a building they will feel safe and comfortable and normal in. Yeah. You know, and, and the basket story cracks me up though. Um, what would you say before we move on to construction? I have to ask this cause I love challenges cause that's where the lessons are learned. What was the single biggest design challenge on this building to design um, what you were picturing? You know, once I had sort of come up with the concept and the, the ovals, you know, so many things just fell into place. It's like, you know, on a project, you can, you can, you can, it's, it's a dream when all of those things align, when the oval not just works as, you know, I had to do a courtyard space. There was no, no getting away from that because that's basically the, typology that schools are done in and that they're used to schools that are done that way and that they function for that and function for many cultures. So, but, you know, from a very practical point of view, I wanted to have these sun canopies that would, that would go from side to side. So, you know, I was living in a rectangle and I could condense the width by making it an ellipse. So there would be less of a stretch for that canvas canopy. Um, and so that came from a very practical, um, practical uh, point of view. And I forgot your question. <laughs> well, that, that's a design, design challenge, but that's a way to solve a design challenge. Oh. I mean, it would have been oh, real easy yeah. just to make a square, but... Yeah needing that more narrow space for those those canopies by going yeah, with an I, ellipse is and i had to say that the thing that i feel was greatest uh you know they got the foundation perfectly there was one wall that's actually not as drawn that's on a slightly different angle but otherwise you know that's the main thing i was like all I care about, or all I, all that needs to happen here is that the foundation goes in correctly. You know, the rest, obviously there was a lot more than that, but like, you know, they don't lose instruments. They do so many things by eye. They, um, they put this, this foundation in and it was exactly to the design. And that I think is the, the design challenge that like, you know, blows away any of the other design challenges. In fact, you know, I, I have my team here in the U.S. and they we would get photographs all the time from India and they would be like, they didn't do that detail the way we drew it. And I was like, they got the foundation in the right shape. And, you know, it's, you know, it, it's fine. I mean, there, there was a like, couple of details that they didn't follow that have caused some water issues, but they can be fixed. And, um, you know, I mean, I, this was, it, to me, this was brilliant. You know, we in the U.S. use all sorts of, you know, technical instruments and things, and they just had their way of doing it that they use. 
And um, I think, you know, to me, that's incredibly profound. And, you know, it's for me, this has been life changing. It's like my whole perspective of, you know, the world and, you know, what is this notion of first world versus third world? Like, how, how dare we call another country, you know, third world or even developing? Because in so many ways, it's just a, it's just just a question of perspective. Like, I learned that actually in India, and particularly in Jaisalmer, they had the most sophisticated method for water harvesting in any desert community. And they had been doing this for centuries because I'm actually working with a group called Women Women Water about um, harvesting water. And as the we have more and more of a uncontaminated water source globally, you know, the these techniques that they've been doing in India for centuries will have to be adopted in the United States everywhere because as water is becoming less and less um, abundant. And so, um, you know, I think to me that goes back to what's third world and what's first world. Like, you know, we haven't been doing this, the water correctly. There's droughts and problems on farms in the Midwest. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert, but like, I just think, you know, there's so much to learn from, from other cultures. That, that is such a, that's, you know, you just made this great point that I never really thought about with the what's third world and what's first world. Are we, are we really so entitled to go put a label on another country and the way they live as th third world just because it's different yeah. than how we live? I mean, in, and, and I've seen that in different parts of the country where they have some system of something that... Yeah. We we don't do as well, but they've been doing it for for centuries, you know. So, um, it, it, I mean, you I, know, I just it's interesting. I something a really interesting fact. Actually, um, I was had the incredible opportunity to meet Gloria Steinem at a very small sort of event. Uh, we were having tea, and the room was filled with just these amazing people who worked for the year. Uh, ERA forever and just um, anyways they're talking about a, a play that's coming up called The Suffs for the Suffragettes and I never knew this but basically the Suffragettes came from upstate New York somewhere I'm not quite sure where exactly that the well the, the movement you know was generated but apparently it's because they spent time with the Native American tribes that were around them, and they noticed that those were not patriarchal societies, that they were actually equal societies. And they, you know, through conversation and through, you know, learning about each other's cultures, they, you know, some of their founding principles were created. And it's like, you know, again, why are women not equal to men? Why has the Equal Rights Amendment not been passed? I mean, it seems to be a completely no-brainer to me. It's like, we are, I mean, how do you say that a male is, that men and females aren't equal? And, um, you know, I bring up Gloria's side of one because she's a hero, but also because, you know, I think most of us think like, oh, did Gloria solve that like 20 years ago? And the reality is, no, it's not passed. And imagine that, like, that the judicial body of our country does not consider women equal to men. Or I know it's more complicated than that, but, you right. know, that's the, what it reads on paper. And, you know, again, I, I, I don't want to get into something that I don't know anything about but i just thought that whole idea that the suffragettes were talking to native americans and here we came and wiped out their cultures thinking that it had no value and now they i had it figured out all along <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well 
Well, the hope is that someday we don't need to have any kind of bill or act or anything to define our rights. It just comes naturally for for all of us, every human. Yeah. We hope, pray. I also read that it was vital to you to include the community in a building made for the community. Um, how, How did what? Tell me about that. What? How did that happen? Well. I mean, you know, again, a lot of these things were just very practical. You know, if you're building something, it's just much easier to have people who are local build it. Um, and also then they have a sense of ownership, a sense of pride in the building. And, um, um, you know, the, the, the man, Kareem Khan, who did the construction, um, you know, I, I, I am in touch with them. He actually, he, he's, he, they actually communicate through uh, a language called Mahuari. They don't actually, a lot of them don't speak Hindi. So naturally they don't speak, you know, they, not, not everybody speaks English, although so many people in India speak English. Um, but, you know, he said to me, you know, you've made my, uh, uh, my name, you have made my, uh, you know, my life, I've learned so much from you. And like, you know, in a place like India, where your name is, has enormous amount of meaning, um, you know, that's, that's, that's an example of having the community involved. And they then, you know, have a vested interest in, in being having it be successful. Um, you know, it's it's the whole the whole name thing is very funny because my last name is Kellogg. No matter how many times I tell people that I'm not related to the cereal company, I mean, it's it's it's, it's just it's, it it can't be true. It be the same name, so I stopped <laughs> saying no. It's not true. I'm like yes. It's <laughs> It's true. I mean, we are related, but you know, there's a lot of Kellogg's in the United States, or you know, actually, mostly in the United States because the spelling has changed. But anyways, yeah. So it's just funny. It's like, yes, you are. Well, I, name- I find I find that particularly amusing because my my industry organization as a spec writer is CSI, the Construction Specifications Institute. Oh. And I get, we all, anybody in this organization gets tired of, CSI, are you a crime scene investigator? <laughs> and, uh, you know, nowhere near as exciting. Let me explain it to you. And I finally got so sick of answering that question. I was in an Uber at a conference I was going to speak at. And the Uber driver, of course, asked, oh, why are you in town? So I'm here for the CSI convention. Oh, crime scene investigator. And I spent the next half an hour talking about <laughs> blood spatter patterns and, and fingerprints and totally had the guy convinced I was a crime scene investigator. <laughs> and, and I owned it before I got out of the Uber and told him I'm t- totally pulling yeah. your leg. But, um, oh. <laughs> you know, it's a, you just at some point you just got to. Just own it. <laughs> you, you're a, a serial heiress, and and have some fun with it because yeah. it's more fun that, at least than explaining it all. <laughs> Let's talk about construction. Just I know we've we've actually throughout the interview had an opportunity to talk about that a little bit. Um, construction, obviously, you've already said, is very different there. Than it is here. We've talked about permitting and codes, and we've talked about nobody using any measuring tools. And, and you mentioning the foundation is funny, and I'm going to draw a blank on which country it was at the moment, but I interviewed another architect about a project, Homes for Hope. Um, I keep wanting to say Romania, and that's not the country, but um, he said they had the same story about the foundation. Just get the foundation right. The local people, just get the foundation. We'll make the rest yeah. of it work. And they were, they were 3D printing a kit of parts for these people to build good homes to live in. Um, How did the construction process look? I would imagine that's got to be a little bit of 
almost gray hair inducing to to be an architect from the United States where everything is measured and drawn out and lined out to to work with a, a bunch of very skilled tradesmen and have them a, approach making that come together in a completely different completely different way how anything any good stories from construction well i um i mean i i chose to take sort of a, a personal interest and in actually visit the site because i think so often and you know i was at a place in my life where i was able to do that um um and so you know i think showing up like in general for anything like this isn't my brilliant words of wisdom but showing up period is always something so you know it it, it showed that i cared by visiting um and there were um you know it, there was there was interesting communication issues um I, I mean from a construction point of view one of the things that i actually was trying to insist that they do was a cavity and I, you know, thought L Lori Baker, who had come up with this notion of a cavity wall for um, thermal insulation, which is basically using air as an insulator, um, um, you know, famous throughout India. Their techniques are, you know, known by everyone. And I actually was trying, on the fall on our Zoom with this contractor, and I was talking about the cavity wall. And I was saying, you know, we, we really need to have this and showing him pictures of Lori Baker's buildings. And, and he was getting more and more frustrated and agitated that, you know, I didn't know why. And, um, you know, eventually he hung up and I was like, oh, I guess you got to approach that differently. Um, but the way they build, which is brilliant and makes sense is not like us where we put like you know the 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 studs up and then the sheetrock on they build the um the veneer stone first which makes sense because that's the part that actually you know from a design detail point of view that needs to be correct so i went to the job site and there was along the foundation there were these little dials set up which were the this, you know, thick facade stone, not really a veneer, like it was a, it was, I think it's four inches or five, four inches, I think. Um, and I was like, what's happening here? <laughs> like, <laughs> well, you know, that going to, to, to our way, my way of thinking, which is you build the back wall and then you put the facade on, right? But no, they do the facade. And they get it perfect. And, you know, and then it, it was actually one of the most phenomenal things was watching them. They, I was like, but it's uneven. And they said, no, 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 we'll fix that. And I actually came back to the job site and they actually had a, um, a, I'm not even sure what you would call it, but some, some type of cutter. And they were doing it by eye. They were doing the height, cutting all of these stones to be level and um you know that's amazing too i mean i think you know i work in a very intuitive way always have and so to me this is like the ultimate in intuition like trust yourself your eye actually tells you a lot more than your instruments sometimes and you know if you go back to the building of like you know the ancient greek in Roman temples, they I forget what this is called, but they adjust for um, the bending of the earth. Um, so their um, their their building actually isn't horizontal; it's adjusted to the way it's seen by eye, so that it's seen from far away as a rectangular building. But in reality, there's a word I can't remember, but um, that you know adjusts for this so you know i mean i think if you took a, a i haven't done this which it would be interesting if you took an actual measurement of it um i think you'd find it to be pretty 
to be completely accurate, but like, no, they just didn't buy <laughs> and, um, You know, I'm like, oh, okay, you got this. <laughs> I mean, that would, you know, I would have twitched. I would have been, t- I'm very analytical. I would have been twitching watching them do that. <laughs> I just well, like, ah. I will slightly, you know, I, the, the, I'm, I'm a slightly different kind of architect than a lot of people in that I believe firmly in sort of trusting the people who are doing the project. And if you actually give them that trust and if you give them that power, it actually needs for better space. Um, uh, Obviously, there's the anal architect in me and, you know, everyone on my team from the U.S. It's like they didn't get that detail right. They didn't really suggest that. And I'm like, they built it in 10 months. They built that building. Wow. And, um, you know, can you imagine anyone mm-hmm. here? Uh, you wouldn't be able to find a stone mason there. I mean, they, they, they're not here. Uh, nor would you find, I mean, you probably find the stone somewhere but you know and there's 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 actual advantage to the fact that stone in Jaisenir is um is is you know very very pliable so um and it's actually it's not really even quarry it's it's so close to the surface that you know it's it's not this kind of environmentally damaging quarrying process um you know that's another thing people you know uh, suddenly i became this sustainability person but really what i was doing was going back to their techniques and and using common sense and also you know being um the guided by the fact that there was a limited budget and you know the dollars spent on on the materials or, or anything else we're dollars away from the education for these girls. So, um, you know, the people say India needs to be sustainable. It's like, oh, we do. They got this down. I mean, there's in these communities that I'm in, nothing's thrown out. I mean, you know, everything is reused on, you know, it's just, it's not, it's not something that, I mean, all the tiles on our roof were discarded ceramics. And actually, I've got questions. As you know, when you do a publication in the United States, you have to list where the materials are from and blah, blah, blah. And um, people were like, how can I get those tiles? As though they could go to Ann Sachs and, you know, buy them or something like that. And I'm like, they're recycled. And they're like, yeah, I know. But, like, how do I get them? I'm like, you go to where the village deposits their pottery and you select pieces and you reuse them in your construction. And, um, you know, that's, that's just a lifestyle. And we don't have that lifestyle. Um, you know, because we, we're, we're, we're so spoiled and we're so, we have so much abundance that, you know, our thinking is just different. And um, I mean, there's another kind of interesting that from a if you if you're from the if, I didn't realize that you represented CSI, but um, here's an interesting thing, and and not proclaiming to be an expert, and I um, actually to be honest, like I just I thought this was a building no one was ever going to see, and uh, like you know it. it probably enabled me to be sort of very relaxed about it in the sense that I knew who my client was, 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 was the, the NGO, but really the girls period. And you no, know, I know what a girl is and I have a girl and I was a girl and whatever. So, um, so, you know, that was the, the, the main, the main, the main focus, the, the, the concept of, of, concrete and sustainable concrete and this is obviously a very very big topic but um we i there was a westerner who works in sustainability who was very critical of me for using concrete um and i um you know i 
first of all, we didn't really have an option. And, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, there are different concretes available in this country that are more sustainable, environmentally uh, conscious produced. And I searched for those in India. They didn't exist because they didn't really need to. <laughs> because one of the sources and problems about concrete is where the sand comes from. And that they're actually, you know, uh, ruining the rivers in China by getting the soft sand from the riverbeds. Well, you know, we were having this discussion on and on and on, and then I finally said, where are you getting the sand? And they said from uh, Nipoli or whatever the name of the village is, which was 20 miles away. So it was like, you know, where did the Romans get the sand to build with water? I mean, they didn't go to China for it. I mean, I was like, it's just illogical. Like the, the sand, you know, had to come for the, the the cement and mortar that they use. They developed in Roman times, you know, locally. And so, um, or as as close as, you know, you know, not was to say not from China. So anyways, right. a lot of the criticism about the concrete is that it's actually all this, it's, it's it's so much it takes up such a big carbon footprint and it's and it's harmful to the environment whereas you know i don't know arguably bringing sand from the neighboring village and using it in concrete um you know when when it's not in an area i mean there's there's more to it i understand like there's reasons that concrete is problem. But, anyway, but that's that's locally sourced, and you're not bringing some material from China. So, you know, there's there's a big difference there in sustainability as well. And it also speaks to how many assumptions we make all the time, um, and come out fighting about something when you know it's not necessary. You don't have the whole story, maybe as well, because it. Yeah, you get a little judgmental sometimes in this business um, based on looking at something and, and make, yeah. like you said, making those assumptions and having criticisms without, there's nothing in this world that you can judge by looking at it. Whether yeah. it's a person or a situation or a building, there's a whole lot of different things that come into play to make whatever that is. So there's a good lesson there. What? Yeah. So I know you have to go. We've gone really long. So I'm going to just go ahead and skip to our final question um, because everybody on the podcast gets this question. So I can't let you go until I get an answer from you. Uh, uh -oh. No, no, it's just a really tiny, easy question, which is not totally, that's a total lie. Um, as individual, <laughs> I, I, I just, I had to warn you. <laughs> so is, as individuals, we all hope I hope we all hope to live a life that leaves some kind of contribution to make the world a better place. I personally jokingly call that my personal world domination statement, meaning my plans to make a difference in my world, how do, I'm going to dominate my world. I may not be able to dominate the whole planet, who knows, but uh, my personal world domination statement. So my question for you is, either personal or professional, take your pick. How do you as an individual hope to make a difference or an impact on your world? What's your world domination statement? Um, I haven't formulated officially my domination statement. I'll have to back to you on that. But um, I just, you know, in very simple ways, like today I actually had these students from other parts of India send me these amazing models they've made. I mean, they're made out of cardboard. They're, they're these, like, delicious thing, but they're, you know, and, um, like, to me, it's like, wow, that's amazing that some boy in southern India um, made this model, and I posted it on Instagram today, because, um, but there's something about that, having that impact, and um, you know, the people that have contacted me to say, you know, I want to 
to you to mentor me, which of course I don't feel like I'm in any position to mentor anybody. I'm just making daily making things up as like or figuring sorting things out. I don't want to say making things up, sorting things out based on what I know and asking the right questions of how to proceed. And um I guess I had decided a while ago, um in there was a, a, a reunion statement that you had to make for, for my college. And I actually said I was at a crossroads in my career. I was going to decide whether to continue to make buildings for people who really didn't need more buildings. They already had homes and they second, third, fourth homes for not that, you know, not a necessity. Or I was going to turn to my art and work only in the studio or I said I was going to make my children my secret agents of change and um, um, and this was a long time ago maybe 10 15 years ago or something and um, I've actually done all three and I really really have all my faith in the next generation and um, and in my children, I'm biased towards that. They are actually, I have a, a board of my, my nonprofit. It's called Tara, which means where the light emanates. And on my board is my very good friend who actually set up the nonprofit and my two children. And so um, I didn't ask them. It wasn't a choice. <laughs> but if it actually takes off and goes somewhere, they're going to be the guardians of, of free exchange through um through what i have as a skill and what many people have as a skill which is our 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 abilities and um talents as architects um and so i'm i'm, I'm counting on them because well, you know <laughs> yeah, um i i feel very very similar to you and and I am also counting on the next generation and I would venture to say that with this building and the care and feeding and clear commitment that you put into this project that you have already made a pretty huge impact on generations to come of some young ladies on this planet so kudos to you for that thank you. Diana thank you so much for joining oh, me well, today. Um, Thank you. I, I've been looking forward to this interview for quite some time. And now I know exactly why I really I know how busy you are. I really appreciate your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. It's been wonderful. <laughs>